We're so thankful for life. We were praying before service this morning, and one of our elders, Lauren, we said, what is God, what's the word God's given us? And she just said the word life keeps coming over, and it's, it's really is. We find life in Jesus Christ. And in his word, we find the words of life. Remember when the disciples, they were really getting pressed because Jesus was beginning to teach some hard things, and, and people were deserting him. They, they were leaving. And he looked at his disciples, and he said, are you, you going to leave as well? And they said to him this, they said, where else will we go? You alone have the words of life. And we know that words matter, don't we? We know that words have power with them. And today, what I, what I want to do is I want to challenge you in God's word that, that our words walk in that power. In other words, what we say, we believe. What we say, our actions live out. What we say really is what guides our life. How many know somebody, and, and don't, don't look at your neighbor, please, this morning. How many know somebody that's full of hot air? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? They talk a big game, but their life never shows it, right? They, they, they say all the right things, but if you observe them over time, the words are empty. And this morning, we're going to look at a passage in Scripture. We're going to look at one of the characters in the book of Mark, that, that had this high, high moment where he's able to say all the right things, but turn right back around and recognize they were just words. So go in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 8. If you don't have the, your Bible with you, if you have you version, uh, you'll find our notes even there, but yet we'll put on the screens the scriptures this morning. Because again, there's something so critical that we've been trying to capture in the last year in this sermon series we just called Ray or Re, R-E. Someone asked me, like, where, where does that word even come from? Why do we announce a, a sermon series called Re? It actually comes from a book, a, a title that I just love. Uh, I don't recommend books all the time, but it's called Read Jesus by Alan Hirsch. It's something I've just been consuming over the last year because I believe in my heart. I've been serving Jesus since I was 16. That's a few years. And I believe in my heart the church is at a critical place in our time that we need to reconnect to not only the words of Jesus but the actions of Jesus and begin to reflect Jesus in a culture that's looking for truth. In a confused culture, how many know the church can't be confused? In a culture that can't find their way, we need to point them to the way, but we only do that when we reconnect to God's Word. My goodness, I'm already preaching. We're just getting going here. This is the introduction. Come on, somebody. Read Jesus. And in this moment, one of the things we've been saying is this, and that is our testimony has to line up with our identity. Our testimony has to line up with our identity. We don't say we're a believer and live like we're not. We don't say, I'm a follower of Christ, but nothing about us speaks into that. So I want us to look at this passage today, and I, and I want you to see uh, how, how God works in this so that our words will line up with our testimony. We go back to Mark 8, 27, a uh, passage we've been reading over the last several weeks, looking at who is Jesus, and, and yet we're going to go further into that verse today. And it says this in 8, 27, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others said one of the prophets. But he asked them the question that you and I have to answer today. Who do you say that I am? Because that's what makes the difference. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him. And this is where Peter got it right. Because remember, Peter is really the author of the book of Mark. Mark was transcribing Peter's works. Peter had a firsthand account of the works of Jesus. But Peter here is being, he's being told on a little bit because he got the words right. He says, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now, why would Jesus do that? It wasn't time yet. How many know there's a time for everything, right? There, there's a time and a season. Even in Jesus' ministry, there was a time where he knew that then the people should know that he is the Messiah, but at this point, if, he says, no, no, don't tell anybody that because they were looking for the wrong Messiah. They were looking for one that was going to come and relieve them of their oppression from Rome, but he came to relieve them of their oppression of sin. And that's a whole nother story. So he told them to keep quiet about it a little longer. And he began to teach them, verse 33, 31, <clears throat> that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Church, there are times where the word of God is so plain we can't miss it. There are other times where, where maybe it's a little seemingly confused, and we've been teaching over the parables through the summer and our midweeks, and uh, there's times where we've got to really press in, but there are also times where he just makes it plain. But what he was making plain didn't fit their expectation. So Peter took him aside 
and began to, what does it say? Help me out here. Rebuke him. I don't know about you, but I'd be afraid of a thunderstorm if I start rebuking Jesus. But Peter here on one end is like, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, I'm going to go suffer and die. And he's like, no, you're not. And he begins to rebuke him. It's like Peter was saying to Jesus, Jesus, you just don't get it. We know who you are. I declared who you are. And Lord, what you're saying right now that you're going to suffer and die does not fit into our plans, God. So, you, so Jesus, you've got to get your act together. You've got to pull it back together because it's just not working for me. It's like you and I reading the Word of God, and we come to a scripture, even like we read today in worship, and it clearly says, this is what you do. And we say, mm, no, that doesn't work for me. That doesn't work for me, God. I'm sorry. You're going to have to come up and you're going to have to do something different with me, God, because I'm special. How many know we're all special, but we're not special, right? We're all special, but we're not special. We don't have a version for Andrew. We don't have a version for Denise. We have a version of the Word of God that says, this is the Word of God. This is the path. Walk in it. But yet Peter rebuked him because he says, Lord, that whole suffering thing is just not working for me. But 33 says, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Now, that's a nickname that you don't want, right? Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Father, today, I pray, God, in this moment, God, our hearts would be attuned to your word. And God, I pray that, Lord, as we walk through this teaching today that you put in my heart, God, I pray that, Lord, we would, we would see ourselves there, God, and we would find ourselves in this moment, God, Lord, being changed, being molded, being made more and more to the image of Christ, God. That, Lord, our, our testimony, our identity would be one, Father, that the world may see you in us, God, and bring glory to our Father in heaven. So, Father, guide us today, God, by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This passage raises a couple of questions, one of which we have dealt with at length over the last three to four weeks, when he, the question of, well, who do you say Jesus is? And I remind you again, you have to answer that, because some believe he's a myth, some believe he's a man, but, but he is the Messiah. And if he's a myth or a man, then you can pick and choose what you want to believe, but if he's the Messiah, guess what? He calls the shots. He's the one that lays it out, and our only decision as followers of him is to follow him. And Peter was a follower. He was a follower. He had seen the miracles of Jesus. He'd heard the teachings of Jesus. Before we get on Peter's case, remember, he left everything to follow Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't, I, I don't remember leaving everything, but I remember what it means to die to self. Peter was all in. He was there, and he correctly identified Jesus as the Messiah. He just didn't agree with the path of suffering and pain. He just didn't understand he, he, he grew up in the, in the Judaic culture where, where the, the promise of the Messiah was something more than what Jesus came. The promise of the Messiah, in their minds, they made up their own legend. He was going to be the warrior that was going to come and kick out the Romans and make, make Israel great again. But no, it was, it was the Messiah that came and said, no, you have to understand, for you to truly be free, I've got to go die. I've got to go to the cross and die for your sin because you can't do it. But it didn't add up. It didn't align. It didn't, it didn't work with them. And now Peter speaks, and his words are empty. He rebukes Jesus, and his words are empty. Listen, if I call Jesus Lord but don't believe or act on what he says, then my words are empty. I don't know how you handle it, but I know how I handle it, but I struggle sometimes during our time of singing here at Hope because I may have a week where my life is not necessarily aligning with the words I'm saying. And we're singing songs, and there's times I stop, and the Holy Spirit checks me up and says, do you believe that? Because, man, you're singing it loud. Do you believe that? Are you acting on that? Are you following that? Or is it just good rhythm? Is it just good song? Don't get me wrong. I love to sing. But I want to sing truth, and I want that truth to align in my life. You see, when God speaks plainly through his word, he means what he says. When God speaks plainly, he means what he says. When he says, love your neighbor, we don't get in a circle and debate, well, what does that mean? Who's our neighbor? Because people did that. You know, we, 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 don't, we don't come around when he says, pray for your enemies, and we're like, well, which enemies? <laughs> Let's get specific here. Which ones is he talking about? When God speaks plainly, is the act of, of a believer is only to obey. Now, now, let's be truthful. Let's be honest here. Some parts of the Bible may, may be a little confusing. 
In fact, there's some parts of the Bible that, that even scholars today will debate over, and, and there are things that people get all tied up in, things like, uh, you know, uh, end-time prophecy. Can I, can I get a yes to that, somebody? Here, here's what I know about end-time prophecy, and I've studied it all over. Jesus is coming back again. That's what I know. That's what I know. What it's going to look like, feel like, sound like, we got some glimpses of it. But guess what? I'm not going to have a class where we can argue about it. Because there's some things we're going to say, I just don't see that the way you, and that's okay. There's some tension there because it's not an issue about salvation. It's about things we may not fully understand. But one thing I know, he said, I'm coming back. You better be ready, church, because I'm coming back for a bride who is spotless, that holiness is a, is a character in their hearts and in their minds. So we've got to come back to God's word, and that's why we teach the word the way we do at Hope. We, we don't want to just give you some, some um, gotcha verses or, or, or teach you just how to cherry pick the Bible so that you, you can win your argument with your aunt. That, 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 that is no good at all. I don't argue. I had to get up and leave a restaurant this week because I was with a friend of mine. We were having a great lunch, and, and you can't help as pastors. We're talking about the Word of God, talking about the church, and a woman walks up and says, you must be pastors. I'm like, oh, shoot. I, I used to go to that church, and you, you, you know what? That church, it just lost. They're just going to hell. Hell. She's very Southern, two syllables. And this is what she said to me. She said, that pastor got too educated. So I had to go find me a church where the pastor's not educated so I can know Jesus. How many know that sometimes Mike's filter works really well and sometimes I have to just walk away? <laughs> and everything in me wanted to go, I'm so glad you found a stupid preacher so you could go to church. But instead, I got up and thanked my, thanked my friend for lunch and said, I'm leaving right now because nothing good is going to come of this. Church, some arguments are not worth having. Come on, get off Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days and stop arguing about things that aren't leading to salvation, aren't leading to life. He says where it's plain, follow it. Get into it and understand that he expects us to live according to his word. So we, we, want, to, we want you to know the word because, again, if not, then our words become empty. And we betray our identity by our actions. We betray our identity by our, by our words, by our attitudes. And guys, that's not pointing to Christ at all. And, and I really believe it comes down sometimes to not fully understanding and applying the next verse in this passage that we're going to look into fully in the weeks to come. And it's found in Mark 8, 34. And that's when Jesus, it says, is calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. Peter wanted Christ on his own terms. P Peter wanted Christ on his own terms. Jesus said to him, you're focusing on the things of man and not on the things of God. And that's really where we get empty. That, that's when our words don't line up. That's when we, we are just going through the motions and not really standing on the truth of God's word because we're focusing on the things of man, what man can do, or what we want instead of the things of God. You see, Peter was saying here basically he wanted the gospel without the cross. He wanted the gospel without the cross. He wanted Jesus to be part of his life. He just didn't want to follow the pathway of Jesus. But church, can I tell you, when Jesus said it's time to make it a decision, he didn't say pray a little prayer and believe. He said, no, if you want to follow me, he said, you got to deny yourself. you got to take up your cross daily and follow me. You see, Peter had the problem that you and I have so often, and that is we have a different trinity. We know the trinity, right? It's the Father, the Son, and the, help me out, the Holy Ghost, right? But for most people, the trinity is me, myself, and I. And that's how we approach the Word of God. We have this big eye problem. We get caught in this tension between pleasing God and pleasing self. We're more focused on what we want instead of what God wants. And because of that, it leads us to a place where our words absolutely are empty and they have no power. But God wants us to live out our truth. Amen? Not our truth that we make up, our truth that is found in the Word of God. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. That's just not lyrics to a song, people. That's the truth of our life. That is where life is found. I am bought with a price. I'm no longer my own. I'm his. 
My worth is not based on what people say about me or what degree I have or what position I hold in life. My worth is found right over here on a cross where the blood of Jesus was shed. And so if we're going to live that way, then our words have to align. And we have to sit in that place and say, God, let us be people who our words align. There was a recent study by, by the Barna Group. If you're not familiar with the Barna Group, it's just a, a, a great organization. There's a lot of survey and research into where the world is in the terms of faith. And they did a survey in the U.S. And it was based on over 100 indicators of, of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. And what they found out of their survey was the average church-going America – their actions, attitudes, and behaviors have almost no differentiation from those that don't know Jesus. Almost none. Almost zero. It's like there's no difference. Did I say we need to reconnect to the Jesus of the Bible? Did I say we need to reconnect our faith to the truth that we find in God? So this morning, I want to share with you five truths that Jesus taught, the Bible taught. It says it plainly, but some people still struggle to believe. Now, I'm going to be truthful. I actually have seven. Seven's a better number, but seven I won't finish today. So we're going to do five, and the others are going to find their way into future sermons. Because these are things that I've seen in my own life. Listen, when I preach, guys, understand this. I'm not preaching to you or at you. We, we're bringing the Word of God for all of us. I got to live. I have to, I have to feel this and, and walk it out just as you do. But I've seen these in my life. I've seen these in many followers of Christ that I've served as pastor for over 38 years. But here's a caution. Whenever we do a list of, of beliefs, here's a caution. It's going to be on the screen. Use this as a mirror and not as binoculars. Okay, church? The Word of God is for you to see yourself and not for you to see everybody else in. Because you're going to be tempted this morning to go, uh-huh, mm, that's you. You're like, you mean texting, hey, you should have been here today. He's preaching about you. <laughs> you know, I learned a long time ago, if you're here, God has a word for you. So take this, let it be a mirror, not binoculars, all right? So first is this, for five things. Jesus clearly said them, the Bible clearly teaches them, but yet we tend to struggle with them. The apostles clearly taught this one, but we have a hard time believing it when it comes to our lives, but it is simply this, number one, suffering is normal. Nobody jump up and shout hallelujah this morning, all right? Suffering is normal. It, it, it is something that is normal to the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Suffering is absolutely normal to us. But yet, if we're going to be a follower, if we're going to follow Christ, we've got to recognize that. And Peter didn't want anything to have to do with it. He's like, I don't want to hear this. Jesus, I, I want to know who's going to sit on the right hand and the left of you in the, in the, in the heavenly, God. I, I just want the good times, God. I don't want to know what it means to walk in your steps, which often leads to suffering. I mean, think about it. It took only four chapters in the Bible for suffering to appear through the fall of mankind, through Adam and Eve, where they had to grieve the loss of their son because one son killed the other son out of jealousy and spite. We later can read an entire book called Job, and, and who was an incredibly righteous man, but all hell broke loose in his life. And I can preach on him. Some of you say it's your favorite book in the Bible. We can draw all kinds of lessons from his life. But when it hits our lives, we rebuke God. Where are you? Why me? What happened? Our expectation can be that suffering is not to be a part of our lives. But what I will tell you this morning is this. If that is our expectation, then we have given the enemy a great weapon over us. Because we live in a sin-cursed, messed-up world. And if, if we really believe that expectation is if you're a follower of Christ, you'll never suffer, then when you do suffer, then what you're going to say is this, my God must not be a good God. Or the enemy will bring accusation. You'll say, oh, what did I do? To deserve this. Guys, when you start feeling shame, how many know that is not from God? When you start feeling condemnation, that is not from God. But the enemy uses that because, again, our mind doesn't align with the word, so our words don't align with God's word. Our actions don't align with their word. But believe me, the word of God says suffering comes. And it really typically comes from three different things that we all find in our lives. Number one, suffering does come sometimes through the will of God. And I know that's hard for some to believe. But there are moments where God entrusts us through suffering to be a witness for him. 
There, there are moments where even the suffering leads to the change and transformation inside of us because of the, the ego and things that have to be driven out when we die to ourselves. So sometimes it comes from the will of God. Number two, sometimes it comes absolutely as from the backwash of being in a sinful world. We get caught up in the mess of everybody else. Come on, somebody. You can't help it. What people do affects us. What people do around us affects us. And you can say it's not fair all day long, but there's nothing fair in this world. And it wasn't fair that Jesus died for our sin either. But he did. And finally, suffering can come from the out, outright attack of the enemy. You have an enemy that hates you. You have an enemy that wants to destroy you. His name is Satan. It's not another person. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't. It is, our enemy is one, Satan. But how many know he's a defeated enemy? But yet he still attacks. But here's the problem with suffering, and that is this. Oftentimes, we really don't know where it's coming from. We don't get a clear picture. God, is this you? Is this Satan? Is it the world? God, what do we do with this? We come back to the truth of God's word. This is although we may not know where the suffering has come from. Our God has promised to walk with us through even the darkest valley of our lives. In fact, he said he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He, he won't leave us alone in our suffering. He's right there with us. But instead of embracing his promise, many times we're tempted to get angry at God and run from him in time of suffering. We do just the opposite of God, what God's word teaches when it comes to temptation. There, there are two teachings about temptation in God's word, and most believers turn them around. The first one is this. It's that inward temptation. I'm not inward. I'm sorry. It's the outward temptation. It's, it's the temptation to sin. It, it's that fleshly desire that, that comes against us. And the Bible clearly says, run, flee from youthful lusts, right? Then there's the other temptation, which, which is really that one that uh, it's hard. It comes through suffering or hard times or even discouragement. And yet the Word of God says, you stand strong there. You stand strong in that place. But we do just the opposite. We're tempted in our flesh, and we say, oh, I'm stronger than that. I'll just pray more. I'll go to church more. I, I, I'll call my buddies. I, I will resist that temptation by standing in the midst of it. And God's going, run, baby, run. Just run. Just run. It's not a lack of faith. Just run. But then we get into suffering, and we get into things of discouragement and the things that press around us, and instead of, instead of running, the Bible says stand. Your redemption draws near. Stand, and what, watch what God is going to do. Stand and give God an opportunity to show you his greatness, even in the midst of suffering. So we have to be careful that, again, we don't do just the opposite of what the Word teaches. Jesus had said very clearly, you're going to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. He didn't say, hey, believe in me. We're going to hang out together in Tahiti until heaven shows up, and we're just going to have a party all the time. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Do you ever, you ever have a verse you just don't like in the Bible? Is that just me? Anybody confess that this morning? There's verses you read, you're like, mm-mm. This is one of these, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. I don't like that. I'm like, call me beloved, but tell me, just forget the rest of the verse. I don't want to hear that. Because honestly, if we're truthful with ourselves, when, when suffering happens to somebody else, we say, how sad, we'll pray for you. But when it happens to us, we say, how strange. Why would God allow that? Suffering is normal. From the very beginning, God has promised to be with us in the trials. He didn't say he'll keep us from the trials. That's why even in 2 Timothy, Timothy said this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And you're like, man, I'm glad I went to hope this morning. I am so encouraged right now. I'm going to go, I'm going to tell everybody, listen to this message, man. It'll build them up. It will if you get to point number two. Suffering is normal, but the point number two is this. Heaven will make it all worth it. Heaven will make it all worth it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that suffering is normal and Jesus is just saying, hey, get over it. He says, no, it's normal. You're in a sin-cursed, messed-up world, but take heart. I've overcome that world, and I've got a world prepared for you that you can't even imagine, and it is promised for eternity. These 70, 80 years of here won't compare 
to the thousands upon thousands upon thousands millennia of eternity in heaven. You see, at the end of the day, if I'm a Christ follower, I have a destiny that will make the worst of the worst here worth it there. And I have to trust that. It doesn't mean that bad things are good. They're not. I hate colloquial phrases. I think y'all figured that out. Well, it's all good. Get out of my face. No. You think it's all good? Come walk with me for a week or two. Answer some phone calls. Talk to some people. Hear what's going on around you. It's not all good. God is good, but it's not all good. It it just doesn't mean that. But compared to what is ahead for the believer, standing strong in the Lord is totally worth it. Look at this verse in Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. He says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now, I, I, again, I don't know about you, but I don't like being slandered. <laughs> I don't like being made fun of. I don't like being judged. I don't like any of that stuff. Let's be truthful. Our flesh doesn't like it at all. But he says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Easy to preach, hard to live. Easy to preach, hard to live. But yet we're called to live by faith. We're called to live by faith. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Church, that is fundamental to our faith. On Christ the solid rock I stand, firm found. That's a foundational principle right there. I believe that he is, and I believe he rewards those who diligently seek him. This is not all there is. I had someone, oh, Pastor, this feels like heaven on earth. Man, you got a shallow view of heaven. If this is heaven, I'm bummed out. I'm disappointed. I'm going to take my Bible and go home. No, God has better. He has more. And we need to learn to recognize that. That's why the Apostle Paul, who was beaten within an inch of his life, who was shipwrecked, who was snake bit, who was imprisoned again and again. I mean, you read the story of Paul, and you're like, how did this man even get up in the morning? But here's what he said about it in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. He is even able to say in Romans 8, 18, for what I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is being revealed in us. Church, if we believe that, it changes everything. But if we don't believe that, it changes everything. And we have to decide. Are we just going to empty words? Are we going to say, oh, I can't wait for it? Really? Or do you recognize it will be worth it all when we see Jesus? It will be worth it all. So though suffering is a, is a given, it, we recognize heaven is a reward. Here, here's a third truth that some people struggle with that, uh, that I find causes their testimony to line up with their identity, and that is this. My sin, your sin, is completely forgiven. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. That's truth. You know why we don't get excited about that? Because we really don't believe it. We struggle with that. Well, if you knew what my week was like, if you knew what was going on in my head right now, you wouldn't say that. The old hymn says, not just in part, but in whole. The Bible doesn't say your sin is completely forgiven when you get your act together, when you get it right, when you figure out life and you start behaving like a good little boy and girl for Jesus. No, he says your sin is completely forgiven the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you surrender your life to him as Savior and Lord. Otherwise, when Jesus on the cross in John 19, 30 said, it is finished, then he was lying. It is finished. It is done. I've paid the price. Now when we confess our sins to Christ, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I said earlier, but people don't live like they believe that. And I'm really convinced there's two areas that cause that, and that is that some have things in your background that just still haunt you. There there are things that the enemy loves to throw in your face. Have you ever gotten down to pray and all of a sudden things just start coming back at you from your past? Can I tell you, that's not Jesus saying, let me drag you through the mud again. That's the enemy of your soul saying, let me remind you who you are. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you got to bow and say, enemy, that's who I was. I am blood-bought. 
I'm a child of God. My sins are completely forgiven. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Church, listen, if he can forgive Peter, who denied him three times before he was crucified, and even cursed him, he can forgive you. If he forgave those who put him to death, he said, Father, don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. He's, he's speaking forgiveness to them. Then we must understand his, his, his forgiveness is complete and total. But we must confess our sins. We must live in that place of repentance. And recognize, God, we just don't take it for granted. We don't just live like it doesn't matter, God, but we believe. Here's the second reason people struggle with that thought. And that is the idea of believing that God really forgave others for what they did to us. Well, I don't think that's forgivable. Pastor, if you knew what they did, I'm not sure that can be forgiven. Last time I checked, the word grace means unmerited favor. It's nothing about deserving. It's nothing about earning. Yet we act sometimes like grace has boundaries. <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate come as you are. Do you recognize that? He's like, come unto me, all that we're going to have you laid, and I'll give you rest. He just doesn't let us stay there. He doesn't just go, hey, it's okay being a sinner and staying. No, he says, come as you are, find my forgiveness, and watch me change your life. The Bible says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. You are not what you did 10 years ago. You're just not. We live in a world today that judges us on our past and never lets us off the mat. Well, back when they were a teenager, they did stupid things. Hello, I was a teenager. I did stupid things. Can we all join that club? And thank God we're not judged by all that. But the reality is, things we did may still be bearing consequences in our lives. We may still be feeling the repercussions of sin, but it's not who we are anymore. When I, when years ago in the past, I had the privilege and opportunity to speak into some jails and prison and times and, and to look at prisoners and go, look, you may be here until they say it's over, but it's not who you are. Because in Christ, you can be forgiven. But the consequences roll on this earth. Listen, church, that's good news. That's the good news of the gospel. We are not identified by culture that wants to keep us in our past. God sees you through the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, because of your faith in him. So when God looks at, down at you, he doesn't look and say, oh, I remember when. Church, there is not a book somewhere that contains all your mess that God one day is going to roll it out and say, let's review your history here. How about let, let's, let's show you how bad you were. There, there's a false teaching out there that somehow when we get to heaven, there's going to be like this big moment of display where every bad thing we've ever done is just going to be displayed. That's sadistic. He said, I've forgiven you. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I've cast your sins from you. Not to be remembered anymore. You're not who you were. Praise God. I'm not what I will be. I'm not there yet. But can I tell you, God's not accusing us of our past. The book of Revelation says that Satan is our accuser. He, he's, he's the one that remembers what you did when you were 12 years old and brings it up when you're 50. He's the one that brings up memories of, of past and, and holds them against us. But no, the Bible says that Satan may be our accuser, but Jesus is our defense lawyer. He's our judge and he's our jury. And that is one rig system I'm very thankful about. Hallelujah, somebody. I, I want him on all sides of that issue. And he, that's exactly where it is. But here's the reality. Some of you are listening to Satan's accusations against you. And you're caught in this loop. I just can't be forgiven. I can't be forgiven. I can't be forgiven. I cursed God one time. I can't be forgiven. Peter cursed God. We're reading his epistle right now. Does that make it right to curse God? No. But let's be real, God is able to forgive. And some are listening to that accusation. While others, and be careful, while others are doing the work of Satan by accusing others of their past and never letting them off of the map because of what they've done. And when we do that, we're setting up this conditional forgiveness 
that Jesus spoke directly into. It goes totally against God's word. He said, as, as high as the heavens are above, Psalm 103, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Church, we, we don't need or ever want to be a yeah, but believer. Well, I believe God forgives my sin, and but, or I, I believe he can forgive them, but, no, that's, that's not the case. He has forgiven us completely, and it leads to point number four, and that is forgiving others is a requirement, not an option. Not an option. I don't know, when you got saved, did God give you a multiple choice? You choose how you want your journey to go. Well, God, I really don't want to have to forgive those people. Oh, okay, that's fine. God, I really don't want to, you know, be sacrificial in, in, my, in my finance, God. Okay, that's fine. God, there's a whole part of my family I really don't want to love. That's a yeah, but Christian. That's Peter saying, Lord, this is not going to happen. And what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. God doesn't cut side deals. God doesn't arrange it so that we dictate what's going to happen. It's not a sim. It is a reality of the word of God. He says, no. He says, we've got to be able to forgive others if you want to be forgiven yourself. Because forgiveness is what we have been given. And the Bible clearly says the measure we use to judge others is how the Lord is going to judge us. Matthew 7, verse 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. For the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Is that clear? Is, is that clear? Yeah, there's nothing confusing there, is it? But if our words are going to line up, when he plainly speaks, we say, yes, Lord. Because here's what Jesus said, Matthew 6. For as you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses unless what they did to you was really, really bad. No, it doesn't say that in my Bible either. But sadly, people think that somehow they're the exception. There are no yeah buts, there's no exceptions. Listen, guys, let's just be honest about forgiveness, okay, real fast. I need to get to the last point. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two different sides of the coin. For forgiveness, some people have been wrongly taught, wrongly taught, that if I forgive, that means I remove all the consequences. It's like if I forgive them, then i got to invite them over for Thanksgiving and hand them the knife that they can stab me in the back again. No, that, that's not forgiveness. But forgiveness says I release them to God. For, forgiveness says that I no longer look for every opportunity to slander them whenever I hear them spoken well of. Forgiveness says I no longer look for ways to get even for what they did to me. Forgiveness, is, <laughs> forgiveness means I quit letting them live rent-free in my mind. You're up at night, you can't sleep. Oh, they just, oh, they're sorry. Rah, 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 rah. They're sleeping like a baby. They're not even thinking about you. And yet you let them live rent-free up here. Why? Because you have a wrong view of forgiveness. God, there's yours. God, I pray good over them. God, I pray your will over them. God, I pray your best over them. And God says, listen, vengeance is mine. And if God wants to bring judgment on them, that's his business. But we don't call it down on them to somehow make us feel better. We can't say, I'm a very forgiving person except for, because your accept is your rebuke before God. And finally, number five, salvation is only found in Jesus. Oh, pastor, that's not popular. Mm, mm, mm. Don't put that on Twitter. You're going to get all kind of hate. I didn't write the Bible. But Jesus made it clear. He said, I am the, help me out, what? I am the way. I am the, I am the, no one. What does no one mean? You know, I did a Greek study on that. You know what no one means? No one. I can do a Hebrew study on it. No one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, do you ever play the If I Were God game? It's a dangerous game. I go there sometimes. But if I were God, man, this place has been burned up a long time ago, including myself. But, you know, if I were God, I want to lean into the thought, you know what, it's just going to all work out in the end. It's just God, God loves everything. It's just going to all work out in the end. 
But when I, when I believe that or say that or think that what I'm saying is, then Jesus, what you did on the cross was a joke. And it didn't matter. Because when he died on the cross, he says, that's the pathway. That's the only way. So if I want to get all universalistic and say, well, there's many paths, and we can be this, that, and the other, and we can all get there. I can, I can have all these millions of gods. I'll add Jesus on the side, or, or I, I can believe in some guy that keeps getting revelations because he's up on the mountain somewhere, or, or I can go live by good works and prove how good I am. No, he says there's only one way, and it's only through the way of faith in Jesus Christ. Church, we've got to recognize this we got to live in this. Look at Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. He says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then, he says, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Are our words empty? Do we stand on what we believe? Oh, I, I had seven. I, seven's a great number. I can't help myself. Real quick, number six and seven. Number six, God wants my tithe, not a tip or leftovers. Number seven, sex without the commitment of marriage is not just sin, it's destructive. Ooh, I can't wait to teach you on that. I can see how y'all responded to that one. Oh, church, let our testimony line up with our identity. Peter had the right answer. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. He just had the wrong attitude towards truth. But God, I don't want to suffer. God, I don't want anybody to think wrongly of me because I believe there's absolute truth. God, I don't want to, I don't want to speak out of your truth, God, because it's going to offend people. God, when I'm going through a hard time, I don't, I don't want to believe it's your will. Oh, I can quote Psalm 23 all day long. I love, oh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I just don't want to be there. And that's human. But church, if we believe, we believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Heaven's going to be amazing because we're not going to deal with this anymore. We're not going to need to do what we're going to do in closing your day where I'm going to ask you in a moment to stand and I really feel led today to pray over the sick. And we're going to ask our elders to come. We're going to anoint and pray for people. We won't be doing that in heaven. How I many know there will not be any anointing oil in heaven? Come on, somebody. There will not be altar calls in heaven. Neither will there be injustice, sin, racism, hatred, fear I want to be there I want to be there how about you how about you how, how are you coming to Christ because you see your actions and your words will display whether you just want him as Savior or whether you want him as Savior and Lord how are you coming to Christ you see your words and your actions will tell us whether he's just someone you see as your friend or if you see that he is God and if he's God, <laughs> there's only one, one relating to him, and that is I bow down and worship him. And when his word is plain, I have one answer. Yes. So where are you today? <laughs>